Hello and good morning to everyone from around the world. I am Kian Tajbaksh, and as the coordinator of the Committee on Forced Migration at Columbia University, which has organized this event, I am delighted to welcome our distinguished panelists today to help us understand the latest migration crisis in Afghanistan and the implications for a wide range of Western and international policies, ranging from commitments to humanitarianism to larger campaigns aimed at countering insurgency and violent extremism in the global south. I would like to thank my colleague, Dr. Dipali Mukhopadhyay for organizing and moderating today's webinar. Dr. Mukhopadhyay is an associate professor of global policy at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. She is an affiliated scholar at the Salzman Institute at Columbia and a senior expert at the US Institute of Peace where she currently serves a senior expert on the Afghanistan peace process. She is vice president of the American Institute of Afghan Studies and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She is the author of a number of books, including Warlords, Strongman Governors, and State Building in Afghanistan, published by Cambridge University Press. Before I turn it over to Dipali to introduce the speakers more fully, I would like to say a few words about the Committee on Forced Migration. The committee is an initiative of the Columbia Global Centers, led by Professor Safwan Masri, the Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development. Columbia Global Centers works within countries that host large numbers of refugees, including in cities such as Amman, Istanbul, Nairobi, and Tunis. Centers in Santiago, Chile, and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, monitor forced migration in Latin America. In response to the pressing challenges posed by, uh, posed by forced migration worldwide, the Global Centers established the Committee on Forced Migration in 2018. The committee brings together 60 plus faculty from across Columbia schools and affiliates who work on the issues of forced migration. We also provide a space to create a multidisciplinary academic and practical solutions to the problems of forced migration. This initiative is one of a number of forced migration related activities that Global Center supports. Others include the Columbia University Scholarship for Displaced Students, the Amman Mellon Foundation Global Center's Fellowship Program for Emerging Displaced Scholars, and the New University in Exile Consortium. Also, there are a number of regionally focused forced migration related programming hosted by our individual global centers. Directly related to today's topic, the committee has contributed to Columbia's response to the Afghanistan crisis, directly helping displaced scholars and students, as well as Afghan members of our community who have been impacted by the recent crisis there. You can find more details of the Afghan response at the Committee on Forced Migration website. More broadly, the goal of the Committee on Forced Migration is to maximize Columbia's ability to provide a university-wide platform to engage, support, and share information across all of Columbia's community of faculty, students, and researchers. We, our mission is to act as a convener to bring together the world's thought leaders in global migration. And so I'm very pleased to introduce today's first event in a year-long series on the theme of forced migration and the crisis of multilateralism. The events in our series feature eminent Columbia and external experts and voices from the front lines. I hope you will join us for future events, and I thank you for joining us for this event today. Over to you, Dipali. Thank you so much, Kian. It's a pleasure to be back at Columbia. Good morning, good evening to all of those who are joining us. I'm so delighted to have been invited by Kian to organize this very important conversation on the forced migration crisis and questions of multilateralism as it, through the lens of that crisis um, in Afghanistan. And I'm so very grateful to the group of scholars and writers and thinkers we've convened here today for this conversation. Let me briefly introduce them in the order that I'll ask them to speak and then I will turn the floor over to them. So we are first joined by Azmat Khan, who is the Patty Cadby Birch Assistant Professor of Journalism and the Director of the Simon and June Lee Center for Global Journalism here at Columbia. 
She's an award-winning investigative reporter, a New York Times Magazine contributing writer, and a future four fellow at New America. And she is working on a book uh, for Random House, investigating the uncounted human costs of America's precision wars. We are also joined by Noura Lori, who is an assistant professor of international relations at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. Professor Lori's uh, book from 2019, published with Cambridge University Press, is Offshore Citizens, Permanent Temporary Status in the Gulf, and we are delighted to welcome her back to Columbia. And then we're joined by Omar Sharifi, who is Assistant Professor of Social Sciences and Humanities at the American University of Afghanistan. He's also Country Director of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies, and he's joining us from New Delhi today. So Asman, I'm going to turn the floor over to you for 10 minutes and then come to Noura and then to Omar, and then we'll open up the conversation. And just a reminder to those of us, um, those of you who are tuning in on Zoom, you're welcome to use the Q&A box in order to put your questions into the conversation and we'll bring those in to the discussion shortly. So Asmat, over to you. Thank you, Dipali. It's such an honor to be here and with Omar and Noura, it's, it's a really lovely panel. Um, I, recently returned uh, about three weeks ago from about a month in Afghanistan. And I, I think I maybe want to begin some of my, my comments here with, with that trip and what I was seeing in some of the areas that I was in. Uh, you know, I spent most of that time in an area, a rural area that lies, it kind of lies along the kandahar Helmand border. It's called Bande Timur. And it's largely desert, um, but there are large populations who live there, uh, agricultural populations. There are a lot of farmers and others uh, who live in these areas. And it was important to me to go there because I had been trying for, for many years to go to this particular place. I'd been hearing news of different kinds of alleged war crimes happening, of different kinds of abuses, airstrikes, uh, other kinds of military actions uh, that were resulting in civilian casualties. And I was doing my best in the past you know, years to try to meet people from these areas and places where I could safely meet them, but I couldn't actually get to Bandi Timor. So in 2019, when the United States was dropping record levels of bombs in Afghanistan in this war, uh, it was really difficult. I remember I had to meet people in provincial centers. And so this time, you know, that I was, you know, I, I got to Afghanistan, I flew into Kabul, I was really surprised um, that I was able to get, not just get to these areas, but to spend meaningful time in them uh, and operate there safely. And what I wound up doing was, you know, a sample in a one particular village in Bande Timor, uh, where I was plotting, you know, different households and interviewing different kinds of people who lived there about their own experiences of war. And one of the things that I learned that, you know, was very new to me was that the number of people in these villages who left in the last five years or the last 10 years was quite high. Um, at times, maybe a fourth of the village, what you know, a fourth of this particular village was empty of civilians. They had left and a large reason for that, this migration pattern, which, you know, was not being, you know, discussed, talked about, um, was because of a lot of the civilian casualties that were happening from combat and from violence in these areas. And, you know, what I learned about what was happening really did actually surprise me. So you're probably familiar with night raids by Afghan forces uh, to help eradicate the Taliban. And you're probably also familiar with airstrikes, whether those are from the Afghan Air Force or whether from the US Air Force. Uh, but I didn't know the extent to which these were used in tandem in some of these places and coupled with corrupt actions of local police forces were creating a, a sort of situation in which it was really untenable for people to live there. And, and let me explain what I mean. Uh, in a lot of these places, there would be a night raid. And during that night raid, even you know, women wouldn't be arrested, they would stay in their homes, but the men would. 
and they would go fleeing. And the reason they would run was because very often, even innocent men would be imprisoned and then charged around one lakh rupees or two lakh rupees, like which is almost a thousand dollars to be released. These people could not afford the money to, to pay that bribe to be released. So when a night raid would happen, they would start running, right? These, they call them Wigos, they're like Toyota Hiluxes would roll into these areas, which are actually, you know, by car, it probably takes around three hours uninterrupted if you, the roads are clean to get from Kandahar city to this particular village. And it's a really bumpy, uncomfortable ride. Uh, Afghan forces, different kinds would come in either on helicopters, uh, in these vehicles, these Toyota Hiluxes, and you know, news would spread that they were coming and people would start, men would start running, even just innocent civilian men. Now, when they would start running, they would be seen in night vision uh, footage running. And oftentimes, this is how a majority of civilian deaths in that village happened, were civilians who were fleeing night raids because they could not pay the bribe to local police forces. Um, you know, I thought a lot of airstrike deaths were happening because of things like, you know, in things I've seen in other places, I've, other places I've reported, uh, especially in Nangar, Nangarhar province and Kunar province, where, you know, this targeting can go wrong, where civilian casualties can be rampant, where people live amongst the local population. And while there may be, for example, a, you know, what's known as a legitimate military target in a particular house, there would also be civilians in that house. And that was how I understood civilian casualties to happen. But in this particular area, I was learning that a large part of it was the corruption of these police forces, coupled with this air power, not knowing who people are, and a majority of civilians that I've, in every single household I visited, had at least three civilian deaths in their family, um, which is quite a large number. And it, you know they would be sometimes as high as 18, uh, depending on, you know, who their family networks were and, you know, who, who they were counting in this. Uh, that was a large reason for why you started to see migration and displacement from these areas. Um, and it was important because this was also, it wasn't just their home, it was their livelihood, their economic livelihood were these agricultural lands. And so a lot of people would wind up moving either to Pakistan or to safer parts of urban centers. Most of them couldn't afford living in a nicer urban center. They might migrate towards Pakistan and stay in refugee camps there, but there were large portions of time in which it was simply untenable for people to stay. And when I was in this village most recently, a lot of people had just returned. And that was you know, really fascinating to me that that kind of migration had gone untracked uh, in these particular places. Uh, a last thing I wanna mention is just how removed from the government a lot of the people in these areas were. And you know, there's so many different examples I could give, but I think one that I found most startling um, was the fact that you know, as somebody who verifies civilian deaths, I often ask for death certificates during my reporting. And I wasn't just told we don't have death certificates for our loved ones. I was told, what's a death certificate? Which meant that they weren't even familiar with a kind of record keeping um, that was supposed to be provided by, by the government that they were under, had no sort of interaction or involvement with them, except on the receiving ends of what often winded up being you know, deadly raids. And this was a major cause for migration. I can discuss, uh, you know, as I wanna make sure that everybody gets time to talk, I can talk about some of the other kinds of migration uh, and, and forced migration specifically that isn't really covered in journalism as much as it should be. Uh, I know that in this current moment, there is going to be a great deal of attention and focus on what will be attributed to the Taliban takeover as migration, and that's certainly the case. But the kinds of economic factors and a lot of the difficulties of living, especially in particular rural terrains, has been a driving force for migration for years. And I think large portions of what we're going to continue to see, coupled with the economic conditions um, that are falling upon Afghanistan, are going to drive continued migration. Thanks so much, Aswan, for raising that. We come back to that, I think, in the conversation. Nora, over to you. Great, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Thank you, Asma. that was 
um, really fascinating and I learned a lot. And I think all of our other panelists actually have a lot more knowledge of what's happening in the ground in Afghanistan and of the Afghan case. And what I thought I could contribute is to try to situate that within a global framework and say a little bit about mm. um, what international human rights um, framework we actually have um, and how and how the Afghan case kind of fits in. So. Um, to kind of take a step back, uh, even prior to this crisis, so these are 2020 figures, um, Afghan, Afghan refugees uh, were one of the largest populations uh, of refugees in the globe. Um, about 68% of the world's refugees come from just five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan is number three, South Sudan and Myanmar. Um, we saw 2.2 million uh, registered Afghans in Iran and Pakistan alone by 2020. And I think, you know, registered figures already, <laughs> there's a lot of difficulty in counting people who move um, and not everyone is registered. And I think um, as Matt's point about death certificates just brings that home of, of you know, we, this, this is just people who are actually documented. Um, on top of that, we've seen uh, 2.9 million by the end, uh, internally displaced Afghans by the end of 2020. Um, in just a few months, that's gone up by over half a million. So we're looking at, again, figures that, that are uh, definitely, the, the reality is higher than this, but 3.5 million um, Afghans were internally displaced. Um, one really, so what's, what's the international human rights framework? How does Afghanistan fit in here. I think one of the things to remember is that um, we do have an international human rights framework for refugee resettlement um, and, and that states that are party to the 1951 convention, refugee convention, 1967 protocol make commitments to provide asylum. However, um, if it, asylum is a basic uh, human right, uh, cross-border movement is a citizenship-based right. By that, I mean that um, there, there are no such things as humanitarian corridors um, in order for people to get asylum. That means that your ability to actually cross borders is entirely dependent on the strength of your passport and the degree to which other states recognize um, you as being able to travel without pre-authorized um, vetting. And that means whether you get visa-free access. And this is highly stratified globally. Um, and Afghanistan um, is, a, is a case in which we've seen a precipitous decline in the passport power of the Afghan passport from in 2006, which is, uh, this, is um, this data is coming from 10 million partners. They have a passport index. And the, the earliest that we have this figures for is 2006. So in, in 2006, Afghan, uh, the Afghan passport was ranked um, 83 in the world. Now it's gone down to 116. So, Prior to this crisis, only 26 countries in the world allow Afghans to enter to across borders without pre-authorized vetting. Um, and when you look at where these countries are concentrated, they're in the Caribbean, they're in Oceania, and then they're in the African continent. So already, in order to get there, you're going to be quote unquote illegal. Um, and so I think that that's the real key is that you have an international human rights framework. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about why it's limited already in its definition, but more importantly, we don't have a requisite um, framework for uh, safe passage under duress. Um, we, that does not <laughs> exist. Instead, um, you can have ad hoc kind of um, cases, but, it, but uh, in order to authorize cross-border movement, but this remains really um, a key aspect of state sovereignty border control. Um, and so what's also limited about the international human rights framework is that we have to remember this was a response to the Holocaust. Um, and, and the framework came together in 1951, really to, to, to say, well, what happens? We have this basic understanding that modern states are there to um, protect their own citizens. And what happens if a state actively persecutes its own citizens? And so um, the framework is, is, uh, creates a, um, an understanding, of a technical refugee of, an, uh, of a refugee is someone who is individually persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social group or uh, political opinion. What that means is that the vast majority of, state, of displaced persons in the world do not meet this definition because 
uh, climate change, conflict, and economic inequality doesn't um, actually get you, um, uh, does not allow you to meet this definition. You have to show that you've been individually persecuted. With this in mind, I think that we know that people who worked for the Afghan government coming in, we could make arguments or, or work for the Americans, we could make arguments that they are going to be individually persecuted. But the point is, how do you then get, <laughs> get access to, to, to these um, uh, refugee receiving countries that are party to the convention? Um, and the, so, so it, just to, to sort of, um, sometimes there's this narrative that the states that are party to the convention are the good states and the states that aren't are the bad states in reality. Um, many of the largest refugee hosting countries are not party to the convention. And some of the countries that have been the proponents of the convention and at their forefront of, of refugee resettlement in terms of commitments also have put um, the highest barriers to allowing uh, individuals to, to claim asylum. So we know that if anyone's interested in this, um, David uh, Fitzgerald has a book called Refuge Beyond Reach. And, and he explains why less than 1% of the world's refugees actually have access to asylum. Um, and there are a whole range of policies that we kind of think of as in migrant interdiction policies, where states will prevent migrants from touching ground in order to prevent them from being able to assert their rights um, under international law and under domestic laws to gain access to asylum. And so one way we've seen this it, it began under the Reagan administration in the U.S. context where um, U.S. Coast Guard would prevent Haitian migrants from touching ground on U.S. soil with the understanding that once you touch ground, you have access to these rights. If you don't, then you don't have access to these rights. And so people know Guantanamo Bay as a, as a um, location for terrorists uh, uh, um, uh, and, and enemy combatants. But actually, that, that initial uh, purpose of that base was to hold um, migrants who are interdicted. And this begins with the US, but we see all of the, the um, uh, high income um, uh, states that, that are Western liberal democracies, um, uh, Europe, the United Kingdom, Australia have been at the, have implemented these kinds of extraterritorial um, uh, migrant interdiction policies. So basically, yes, we have these really robust protections, but one, it's really hard to get that unless you show individualized persecution. Two, even if you can, you have no safe passage. And three, the countries that have the most robust protections have also been the most active at finding ways of circumventing their own humanitarian um, commitments. And so um, I'll, I'll stop there and just say that there's more to say about Responsibility Protect and how that kind of um, uh, relates here. But um, th thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to the questions. Thanks, Nora. A lot we're going to come back to there. I think, Omar, let me come to you. Um, thank you very much for having me tonight. Um, it's good to be uh, to see all these uh, distinguished panelists. Um, just talking about the whole idea of uh, migration, refugees and everything in Afghanistan. Um, um, I like to actually put that in a context of what that's actually meant for us as an Afghans. I'm saying this because for the last 20 years, we've dealt with the international community and every aspect of our lives came under kind of sort of like a, like a really scrutiny of how we have to be, how things should supposed to be, the whole war against Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and everything was sort of like analyzed and explained in a way that somehow did not make sense to us as our thoughts. And so just to put for the whole understanding of the refugees and the staff, I've honestly never had a refugee or actually never, not many, not no Afghans actually living abroad before 1980. So because not being kind of part of a colonial empires and stuff and not being part of like, um, or not having like sort of like an understanding of what kind of um, West versus East and everything meant, Afghans did not actually experience that type of migration or being a refugees before 1980. And only after 1980, the Soviet invasion in which actually a lot of displacements internally and also, um, in terms of like fleeing the country happened. But it was mostly in the neighboring countries of Pakistan and Iran. Majority of Afghans went to Pakistan and um, some of them went to Iran and stuff. Maybe they put around maybe five to six million people in a way left between 1980 and 19, 
sort of 2000, 2000, you put in that like around 6 million people out for a population of sometimes 25 something million people. So that was the first time ever in history um, since the invasion of the Mongols um, and Genghis Khan in which the Afghans actually experienced a slip of displacement. And now, but the interesting fact is like by 2002, 2003, after the fall of the Taliban and Al Qaeda government in Afghanistan, around based on the UNHCR reports, 5.3 million Afghans returned back, returned home. Which means the exodus that happened in Afghanistan were not just simply to ask for refugee status or something. Some people went, maybe like maybe 100, 200,000 Afghans actually immigrated to the West, but majority of them did not want to do that. But this was the time, and at the same time, the whole promise of the good and the promise of that the Afghanistan will be free this time and they will be like a more several connected back with the world. So which probably 80, 90% of the Afghan, I, I don't know exactly the number, but 5.3 million people based on the OTR return to Afghanistan. And now talking about today and this massive exodus. Now, this kind of massive exodus, we've seen it in two phases. First was 2015, 2016. But majority of the people who actually went to Europe with this wave of migration that happened were predominantly, though I'm not sure how many of them were Afghans, but majority of them left for Iran. Based on the statistic that on some Ministry of Migration gave in 2019, about 187,000 people actually, they thought it might have left Afghanistan after 2014, between 2014 and 2016. But now they talk about a million people in the South, so a lot of from Pakistan and Iran, a lot of people who actually left to Europe and stuff and asked for, for um, asylum and stuff. We do not know who they are actually, given that kind of the same language we speak with Iran and the same language we have a lot of similarities speaking, at least with part of Pakistan and stuff. So we're not sure how many of them were Afghans, but, the, but what is today, actually, we see like a massive exodus right now. We don't know how many people left, but in the minds of a lot of us and a lot of Afghans who actually left, it is, um, I mean, Professor Laura, Professor Laurie kind of talked about who can give them refuge. Um, as Asmat Khan talked about all these crimes and stuff, but in the minds of us, when we, a lot of people, Afghans left the country, they don't see it as sort of like, oh, I'm fleeing something. It's a kind of, we, a lot, for a lot of us, kind of a civil disobedience. Nobody wants to work with the Taliban because of the occupation of Kabul by the Taliban, Al Qaeda, and Pakistanis. So a lot of Afghans actually do not want to work with these people, do not want to be part of that world again. Okay. Because they experience a lot of things in terms of connectivity with the world, in terms of respect for human rights, in terms of like as access to some basic level of education, like services and everything else, and they do not want to be part of it. Now, this is different from the 1980s in which people went to Pakistan or to Iran to fight back the Russians. Now, we, and for a lot of people who left it, because they, they're trying to get into the West, not because they simply see it as, okay, this, we're going to find a better opportunity. It's because now all these kind of countries around us gang up to support Taliban and Al-Qaeda and all these extreme groups, and that's a fact. So looking at that, this kind of level of migration, and I'm looking at a lot of sort of like discussions among, um, among our people here in different parts of the world right now, and people who actually live, they see that it's like a major kind of a saying that we do not want to be part of the system anymore. We don't want to help them build another state that is, in a way, promote suppression. And um, I mean, the world wants, I mean, a lot of people in the world like look at this as some sort of people are helpless. But part of it is just kind of not working with these people, it's not being part of helpless, it's kind of a decision to leave everything you have. And knowing that this is also different from the 1990s kind of or 80s and stuff, because a lot of in the last 20 years, an infrastructure was built in Afghanistan. A life has emerged. A middle class emerged in Afghanistan. Institutions were built in Afghanistan. And people left everything they have because they do not want to be part of that. So now, what are we going to do with that? And how we have to kind of look at this things. When we talk about the atrocities that happened in the last 20 years in Afghanistan, part of the Afghan war, in a way, um, that uh, was portrayed in the West with United States intervention, um, bombing, attacks and everything. Majority, over 80% of the civilian casualties, displacements were happened with them by the Taliban. 
and by their associates, whether it's Lashkar Taiba, whether it's like Sabai Sahaba, whether it's like the, all the other extremist groups in the kind of base in Pakistan. So this displacement is not kind of a new thing for the majority of us because deliberately the, the whole idea of like not making things work or make, make sure that nothing can work in Afghanistan is to make Afghanistan ungovernable. And that was the major kind of a part of a plan of the Taliban and their associates and patrons in the region. So today, what will happen to all of, to all these hundreds of thousands of people now that are trying to leave and not work and be part of this kind of a Pakistani Taliban sort of a government or an occupation that's now kind of dominating our reality in Afghanistan. Nobody knows, nobody expects anything because the, this, when for the first time in our history, we confronted the international community in 2002, we never had that experience before. Before that, we never seen that many foreigners in Afghanistan. And then the message that came with that was the message of human rights, the message of like human dignity, women's rights, and all the values that everybody sort of sort of believed. That message sort of shattered to, to a degree when we when this kind of migration happened in 2015, 16, when actually the Afghans faced a lot of discriminations and stuff in the West. And people realize that it's actually not about many values and everything. It has to do with a lot of things. So what will happen from now on, what it means for all of these people who left Afghanistan now completely look, abandoned deliberately everything, despite the Taliban assurance that we're not gonna kill you, but people thought we're not gonna cooperate with you and we cannot be part of like an occupation force, kind of an occupation, occupation government. So at least there is no sort of uh, illusion about sort of humanitarianism in the face of what happened. So, and if what we're seeing today is try to do the best you can and trying to find out your own story. This time, perhaps it's the time for you guys to tell your own stories in which, because um, the interesting thing about Afghanistan are not being part of like, sort of like the international community for a very long time, not officially, not speaking languages like English and others, everybody told how, how we are to each other and how we are supposed to be to each other. But this is a generation emerging at once in the last 20 years that actually now deliberately decided not to be part of the, the system. And they are now completely in, in a situation that nobody knows what will happen to them. Um, people talk about them as like, oh, you guys are like now escaped. You should find some humanitarian ground to kind of can give you like a space to breathe or like find you some space to live and stuff. But at least among the displaced in Afghanistan right now, it's more about how we have to tell the experience of democracy, how we have to tell our own stories by ourselves. So in a sense, everything about now this large group of people who now somehow knows how to speak a little bit of English, educated, experienced a life in which at least on principles, certain values were respected. And now, and they were told by the international community and they believed that. So kind of in this circumstance now, people are scattered, nobody knows what's gonna happen. The international legal system is very complicated. I mean, I'm experiencing it in India right now here, how to navigate the bureaucracy, it's almost like put uh, Mark's favor into shame to understand how to move ahead with all these obstacles you have to see. But what matters is the story of the refugees, not about just simply finding them a place so they do not die or they not be completely forgotten as well. The story of the refugees in Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, this time, perhaps for the first time in history, is a time that these, they have their own way of looking at the world. They want to tell their own stories and actually they had experience with internationals. Perhaps that's probably the first time in which nobody can come and read and write about us and how we're supposed to be, but like, how we experience the others and what we want to be in the world in which we, human dignity apparently or hopefully is a principle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. There's so much rich that's already been put on the table in this conversation. So let me let me come back to first to, to Asma and Noura with a question and then a different one for, for Omar. I think Azmat and Noura, both of your comments and my own experience of the last few months of trying to understand what this 
displacement crisis looks like and how states are engaging with it. A lot of what you've explained to us is that the states that intervened in Afghanistan have been part of creating this crisis, right? As a function of the means by which they fought war, but also the ways in which they conceive of their own state-making projects and their nation-making projects and the ways in which they police their own borders and conceive of citizenship. And so I'm trying to understand what, what are their incentives? Let's talk about the states in the region, but also those in the West. What are their incentives to collaborate? This panel is the theme of this year is about multilateralism and forced migration. What are their incentives to cooperate, to collaborate in terms that actually center the rights and the humanity of Afghans? It's my own, my own experience of this crisis has been they're not really incentivized to do that. And so I'm trying to understand, uh, one of my students said to me, she herself is an Afghan, she said, I think these systems are working precisely as they were designed, which is to limit the number of people who can actually comfortably and easily navigate the international system to spaces of safety. So can you talk a little bit more to us uh, about what the incentives of states are? And then I wanna come to Omar and talk about this idea of migration as in and of itself a, a political act on the part of Afghans. But Asmat, let me start, start with you. So let me ask you to unmute Asmat. Apologies. Uh, yeah, so I think it's important, and Omar had referenced this, uh, you know, the sort of the role of Pakistan and its incentives in this area. And, uh, you know, this is, a, I think it's been one of the most important, uh, you know, bordering nations to have played a role in this over a sustained period of time. And of course, you can trace that back to the Soviet war and the funding of the Mujahideen by the United States. And Pakistan became a place where many Afghans had come for a, you know, very, for a portion of time. And I think something that's often neglected in conversations about some of those patterns are the extent to which certain Pakistani cities have been built on the backs of Afghan laborers who came, you know, whether that's Karachi, whether that is uh, Peshawar, but essentially, you know, this was a population that contributed immensely to this country where they were not treated well, um, where often they encountered, you know, racist behaviors and attitudes. Uh, and, and that was certainly, you know, it has been a source of pain. You know, I know that many Afghans don't want to go live in Pakistan or be refugees there. This is not a desire. Um, it's something, it's a situation they were forced into that they would like to be able to go elsewhere, especially if they're in the South, if they're along the border from Afghanistan. And that was the, um, the easiest sort of route for them to go. Uh, I think that's important to acknowledge. Uh, I wanna pull up actually, it might take me a second, but I wanna pull up a quote um, from the Afghanistan papers, uh, which I think also really gives you a sense of the uh, intentions of Pakistan, right? I think that there are some who say that, you know, there's some in Pakistan who say that they have not played a role in fomenting the Taliban besides obviously offering protection to senior leadership, uh, which is simply not true. And there are others who have really put the blame on Pakistan for the entirety of the Taliban's resurgence, uh, which would also be failing to understand ground realities. Uh, but I think one of the, I just wanna pull this up. Something that uh, the former chief of the ISI apparently said in a conversation to, with Ambassador Ryan Crocker, um, of the United States, and this was recorded in the Afghanistan papers by Craig Whitlock, the Washington Post reporter. He said, I know you think we're hedging our bets, and you're right. We are because one day you'll be gone again. You'll be done with us, but we'll be still going, but we're still going to be here because we can't actually move the country. And the last thing we want with all of our other problems is to have turned the Taliban into a mortal enemy. So yes, we're hedging our bets. Uh, so this is, you know, the head of Pakistan's intelligence agency really admitting to the kind of complicity that Pakistan has been accused of for years, 
Um, but is also really, I think, goes back to your point, the Pali, right, which is that foreign interventions in Afghanistan have for so long allowed not just those countries at war, but neighboring countries to act in ways that they see as strategically in their interests that have had devastating costs for the Afghan people. Just even in some of the areas I was in recently, I was able to find, I would often verify civilian deaths because people didn't have a uh, graveyard didn't have uh, death certificates by going to the graveyards and looking at tombstones. And so every time I saw a graveyard, I would stop, get out and, and try to look at them. And, uh, you know, at various points, I did find, you know, a grave, graveyard full of Pakistanis. And, you know, it didn't just say their names. These were people who'd come to fight. You know, they were considered their markers, whereas martyrs. And, um, you know, it wouldn't just say, you know, no, you know, this person from North Waziristan, their markers would say things like Karachi, Haripur, Hangu, these are cities across Pakistan. So certainly Pakistan has played a role and this, this is, you know, undeniable. Um, and you can see the devastating effects it had. I just also want to make one point just about earlier. Something that I didn't say when I was speaking was that you know, what I've been finding and what other journalists have been finding is we've had more access to areas where Afghans have not been able to give voice to their experiences because they've been in areas that are extremely unsafe to access or they didn't feel comfortable, especially they felt so isolated from that government. A lot of these deaths weren't, be reporting, weren't being reported. And that also means that numbers that were used for years to talk about civilian casualties were wrong. You know, numbers of civilian casualties resulting from different violent actors in the region have been wrong for years. And I think that's just also important to note um, when we're talking about the experiences, especially of those who lived in rural battlefield areas. They are people we have not heard from. I met people on this trip who told me that they had never spoken to a journalist or any foreigner who was not a soldier in their entire life. Um, so that, that can be really telling, I think, about who we've heard from and what we've heard. Thank you, Asmat Noura. Yeah, thank you, uh, Asma. I learned so much from um, what you just said and, and, and Dr. Amal also uh, from your intervention. And I'll take this question of, you know, what are the incentives to, what, what incentives do states have for actually cooperating or collaborating in a way that centers the human dignity and rights of Afghans? I would say that, um, you know, little few <laughs> um and not um not to be cynical but we also know that um when it comes to things like um migration enforcement or even refugee resettlement it's it's not enough to just look at international commitments we actually also have to look at the power politics the international mm -hmm. relations between states and also very importantly domestic politics and electoral pol politics especially because um, the states that we're talking about here, I'm thinking especially the United Kingdom and the United States, are um, uh, liberal democracies. And, and when it comes to power politics, it's quite fascinating that the Cold War actually had, in some ways, an expansive effect on um, refugee uh, uh, resettlements in the sense that um, it was often um, a way of embarrassing your enemy. <laughs> um, and so I th think of the here of, um, you know, a Cuban, uh, Cubans had an expedited entry into the United States. And, and you, you kind of giving someone refugee status is also saying something about your enemy state as opposed to um, a friend state. So you're saying that this state is not meeting its, its um, uh, responsibilities towards the citizens. And so it's kind of a critique, right? Um, I think what we're seeing now is much more of a kind of cooperation. States are cooperating, but they're cooperating on interdiction and um, the, the prevention of migrants from touching ground. And we see that this has taken on so many different forms. I mentioned migrant interdiction, where you're actually putting naval navies and coast guards in some way, in some cases like Italy and Libya, the, uh, these, these funds are going towards the armed militias, right, um, to, to interdict migrants. Um, and in other cases, we see cooperation around this idea of um, investing in the development of sending countries or in providing aid for um, uh, transit countries. So we'll provide aid and you prevent migrants from, from leaving our territories and coming to the EU or US or Australia or some of these other states. So um, there's the international dynamic. We do see cooperation, collaboration, mostly on the question of security and border enforcement and less on the question of um, uh, human dignity and protection of human rights. Um, 
And then also important is to look at the electoral politics. And so you might have, this is not to say, none of these states are homogenous actors, right? It's not to say that there aren't people who are working really hard and are really upset about the fact that, for example, the US isn't resettling more Afghans. We know that um, uh, US um, military um, personnel and others have been um, really trying to actively um, work on this, but, but it's really important to look at the, the kind of competing pressures and competing actors. And when it comes to electoral politics, we've seen a rise of anti-immigrant sentiment globally, especially in, in, in democracies. And, and we know that um, uh, when it comes to voting, <laughs> domestic issues tend to um, uh, factor more highly than uh, foreign policy issues. And so when it comes to kind of catering to their own audiences, having a strong stance on, on uh, border enforcement and security, especially again, thinking about the shift away from Cold War to war on terror, um, there, there's really much more of a focus on in, individual migrants as being, you know, um, a possible terrorist suspects or providing this, uh, posing this kind of security at risk. So collaboration, cooperation is occurring, just not in the, the direction we'd like to see. Thanks for that, Nora. Uh, let me just remind our audience members again that we're going to come to your questions, so feel free to drop those into the Q&A box. Omar, you talked about the idea of migration as an act of civil disobedience, and I wonder if you can say a little bit more about what your own work has thought about how Afghans conceive of their own uh, belonging within the, within the country, within the nation, and how they think of their own citizenship. If you think about migration as a sort of an act of political, of reclamation of one's political power by through exit, then can you say a little bit more about what you think this current moment means for Afghan conceptions of citizenship that might be more expansive than what it means to just live within the territory of, of the country then in this moment? Well, um, so to kind of understand this whole concept of uh, citizenship and everything in Afghanistan, or to kind of imagine an Afghan nation, uh, everybody knows that Afghanistan is made of a lot of different ethnic groups. Uh, predominantly at least four major ethnic groups and staff. So Pashtuns, Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks and staff. And there has always been some problems in terms of what means kind of, is there any Afghan nationalism and stuff? Because given that such a diversity defines Afghanistan. But at the end of the day, but at the same time, um, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, Afghanistan is literally the only nation from Bangladesh to Balkans, a Muslim nation that never had, never has so far, a separatist movement in a sense, so despite all the sort of things, so while the state never played an important role in terms of defining what Afghanistan means, it was the history, it was the culture, it was some sort of not being part of like a, a kind of being the only independent Muslim nation for a long time, somehow in a way cemented an idea of being who they are for the Afghans. And then when the Soviets invaded in 1980s, a lot of Afghans, millions of them left the country. And in that time, they sort of, it was portrayed as an idea of, um, of like uh, Islamic sort of migration, which we call them the Hijrat, in which people do not want to live as an kind of under the gov infidel government. Um, and they just want to go, go to another place and then in order to reclaim back their homelands. What is different today is um, post 2001, um, Afghanistan for the first time was reconnected with the world. Uh, in a sense that if you look to this between 92 and the fall of Kabul, to Mujahideen and 2001 with the ousting of the Taliban after the United Nations, United States intervention. Um, a lot of, uh, it was the only period in the history of Afghanistan that we were completely cut off from the rest of the world. The Taliban and the Pakistanis did not allow anybody to have any level of contact. So they even to the level, to the way that for the whole country, there were only like four phone lines available two in Kandahar, two in Kabul, to actually make a phone call abroad. And you had to actually, um, in a sense, um, kind of register your name a few days in advance in order to have the ability to 
make a five minutes talk. And there were only two lines that came from Quetta and Peshawar to Kandahar and to Kabul, so nobody, and they were like directly monitored by the Pakistan intelligence officers. So whoever you talk with your families and stuff, you could not, um, you have to be very careful. After 2001, we were confronted with another, a new, completely new phenomenon called the international community. An international community intervention, United States, Europe, Japan, China, India, everybody else who came to Afghanistan, they did not come just as simple as like, okay, we come, came here for, no matter what they say, but at least in the minds of us, they came with messages. And the messages was talking about girls go to school. People will not be beheaded. There will be a constitution. And, um, and so, and people will have the right to choose their leader as opposed to being imposed upon. So the last 20 years, which is kind of a long time, if you look at that, an entire generation millions and millions went to school. Despite the war, devastation, suicide, bombing, destruction and everything else, and massive civilian casualties, specifically when it comes about the election periods, which based on the United Nations and everybody ate around, it, except that in the 2019, 20, only 74% of the casualties were caused by the Taliban. Before that was around almost about 86 to 92% of every civilian casualties were caused by the Taliban and their associates and stuff. People somehow started to engage with a completely new, but not unfamiliar phenomenon in which, um, oh, we belong to a country in which it's not alone. And we're, and so that as uh, 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 Professor Laurie mentioned about the passport in which you can actually can travel. Before that, you had no, you have no, you, there was no passport in a sense under the first Taliban government. And, um, and only um, you can get that from a box Taliban embassy in um, Islamabad, in, in which you can only actually get a box on a visa mm. and stuff. The rest of the world technically did not recognize, but after 2000 were so kind of five, six, in which we had actually the passports and stuff so we can travel and stuff. So there was a connection with the world and the whole idea is like, you not only belong to a country, but you belong to a country which is part of a global community. And then this whole story is about um, women's rights and human rights and education and civil society and all these things started to become everyday talk. And the best thing that actually happened also in the last 20 years is that Afghanistan somehow managed to develop a robust media. Maybe international media didn't have this access or not, but the Afghan media access on everything. And then at the same time, communication. 22 million people out of a population of maybe 30, God knows exactly how many, actually managed to have um, SIM cards and talk to each other. And then the roads were built in which people can go around and talk to each other and visit each other. So uh, in a way then, the whole idea of being part of a new citizen of a new Afghanistan developed in part, but being part of a citizen of a country that is not alone and part of a global community. So in a way it can develop. Now, the major shock was 2015, 16, where some Afghans left, and then they had this Islamophobia in Europe and all the things that happened specifically. Not many people actually, I don't think anybody came to the United States, but there was a migration from Iran and Pakistan specifically, and as Afghanistan, who went to Europe, to Turkey and stuff. And then they had Islamophobia and everything else. So the people were starting to question this. I remembered like, in that time I was actually doing my field work and all these people were coming to me and says like, what's going on with the international community? I'm hearing that they're talking that the Muslims are bad. And uh, so, so <laughs> all these things they're saying. <laughs> so I was actually sitting in a mosque in Mazar Sharif and Kandahar and stuff. So uh, it was the first thing in a sense. But the whole idea that kind of developed in a sense that we are part of something that is global. And today, with the Taliban and Pakistani occupation of Kabul back again, and then overrunning of the country and mass and destruction of all the institutions and stuff, it's kind of systematically now going uh, are happening and stuff, people just do not want to be part of something that's isolated. People want, there's a lot of talk about Taliban being a government. Taliban actually gave the Taliban a chance to build a government. I mean, Pakistan's trying their best to actually portray Taliban as something capable of building government. And I don't believe, I, 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 and I believe some members within the Taliban and actually want to build something that kind of sounds like a government and stuff. But at the same time, 
we who experienced the Taliban the first time and the Mujahideen before that, and then the experience of the last 20 years and just a massive civilian casualties, killings and all destruction and everything. And Afghan media being extremely robust, reporting every minute, every minute of it and stuff. Um, we know that we are dealing with a kind of a group that is absolutely want to completely bring us to the isolation of the 90s. The several disobedience I call us leaving your entire life. Maybe some of them actually may not even facing a threat. Um, um, leaving their entire life and want to kind of do not be part of it, as they said, they want to be isolated and alone again. So the idea of being reconnected, being part of something bigger, has always been in the minds of Afghans, not be specifically because of the trauma of the 1990s, in which nobody was considered even a human. And now to just answer about Asma Khans and other specifically the chief of the ISI who mentioned, just to kind of be very precise, between 96, and 2001, over 120,000 Pakistani military and volunteers fought for Taliban. And Ahmad Rashid have mentioned it, and there's a, uh, and, and, and Aisha Sadiqar, and a lot of books actually published on that. And even and even in 2001, the American bombing and happening, I was in Kabul, and we've seen caravans after caravans of thousands of the volunteers coming, including the Frontier Corps. And even today, when we see within the Taliban, there is like, in, if you look what's happening in Kandahar, what's happening in Jalabad, specifically in kind of a partial speaking areas and stuff, there is an the idea of like, are we becoming again a, a kind of a proxy for Pakistan again? So it's a very complicated picture. It's not that the Pakistan kind of just plays because Afghanistan is there. Afghanistan has been there for a long time, but Afghanistan was never allowed to actually have it because the idea of like making Afghanistan ungovernable. Taliban are not, by 2003, 4 Taliban was finished completely finished, they were like, they were re rebuilt after Iraq war. And now you built, re rebuilt something and then you throw it on the other country and says, we want, we don't want to make them angry. I find it a little bit ironic to be, but anyway, apart from all the things that's today, Afghanistan is overrun and hundreds of thousands of people left the country. And these are the people, unlike the, not just the villagers who left, a lot of villagers are already leaving, they're trying their best to leave. But this isn't talking about a generation who actually educated, who knows how to run a ministry, a school, a hospital. And this is a decision and they all have lives, families, wives, children, mothers, brothers, jobs, car, a cute dog, whatever. So they all have, they leave everything behind because they just don't want to be again, absolutely isolated. They, we have um, an expression that, um, you should not be, I mean, it's, it's in, in, in Pashto, we say that um, uh, you should be careful not to be sting by the same, bitten by, this, by the same snake again twice. So this idea of like, you do not want to be isolated again. So they want to leave because everybody knows that you cannot survive in the modern world as an individual, as a community or as a nation, if you're cut off completely. So I want to build build on this point. It's also a question that's come in our in into the Q and A from the audience, which is I think one of the central dilemmas for the for international organizations, for non governmental organizations, but also for states, which is if the isolation of the nineteen nineties is to be avoided, that Omar you just described. The challenge then becomes how to engage with Afghans while the Taliban is occupying the regime, occupying power as a regime that took it by force, right? And so I wonder if each of you can say a little bit about what that dilemma looks like in the context of the migration crisis, because one of the things that we know, of course, right, is that there are certain circumstances in which people will make a choice to leave. And there are other circumstances in which life will become so unbearably difficult that the decision to leave will, will not even be a decision, right? It will become the only option. In either of those cases, the, the notion of a multilateral response at some level requires, if if the interests and concerns of Afghans are to be in any way reflected, requires a kind of engagement with those who have power in the country. 
And so I wonder if each of you can say a little bit about what those dilemmas look like to you, if there are analogous cases that we can think about from which to learn basically what it means to not isolate Afghans in the way that Omar just described, but also to have an awareness about the kinds of leverage that the international community does or doesn't have vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban and the means by which engagement on humanitarian questions should or should not be part of that leverage that's exercised. Um, and what are the modes then of engagement that make sense for you? Azmat, let me come to you first on this. Sure. So I, I should just say it. I'm, I'm only an investigative journalist, so I, you know, I can't give policy recommendations, but I can point out, you know, some of the the kinds of concerns that I was hearing about. And again, it really depends on which area you're in, not just whether you're in an urban center like Kabul or in a rural area, but also just, um, you know, what position in the battle of the last 20 years that province or particular parts of that province have, have been in. Um, but I know so many people are deeply concerned by the economic conditions right now and the isolation that they're seeing just also because remember these people are farmers with goods and they want to be able to sell them across borders and right now they're having a lot of problems with that coupled with the fact that there are no payments you know it's not just that American aid has been cut off or that other countries have cut off these kinds of payments. It's also even just Afghanistan's assets have been frozen. And some would say this is a point of leverage or a means of leverage. Uh, but you know who it's going to affect most, which are ordinary funds, right? Like this is going to be, uh, they are going to be the ones who are really going to be most impacted by that. And it's not my job to say, you know, the United States should lift this or send that, but it's certainly something that I'm looking at in terms of trade um, with, you know, what people are able to do with the goods and services that they're trying to, to sell in terms of uh, livelihood access to things like healthcare, et cetera, under this particular, all of that is going to suffer. You know, Afghanistan already had high maternal mortality rates. Um, I'm really concerned about what the impacts of that isolation and the lack of, um, by some, you know, there's some who are arguing that you should really cut off this kind of engagement. Uh, and I, and I just really wonder about what the effects are going to be for that. Nora. Thank you. I mean, I think to follow you ask a really rich question and I'm going to pick up a little bit on what Asmat and Amar have both um, talked about in terms of, um, you know, everyday Afghans and, and this idea of um, uh, being isolated versus not. And I think you asked also not just about what kind of leverage does the international community have, but um, recognition of the Taliban and how that factors into cross-border movement. So, um, uh, one of the things I think to, to take it back to the basics is what is a passport um, is essentially a document that um, identifies a sovereign entity that has to be recognized by other sovereign states. And that entity has to, um, the, the purpose of the documentation is identity verification. So you're vouching for an individual and you're saying, I am who I say I am by virtue of this document. Someone has vetted me. Um, and so in, uh, first of all, it's going to be the question of, are these pa passports going to be recognized? Um, uh, that's the, the first point. The second point is then in addition to recognition, what kinds of um, uh, the, the visa-free access has to do with whether other states think that you're safe enough to allow you to cross borders without being individually vetted. Um, and so those are the two aspects of passports that I think really matter here. And I don't think it's, a, um, it, 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 we have to pay attention to the way that confidence from the international community as that declines, that makes these documents huge liabilities. And I, I, I think of a friend who's from Iraq who said, you know, in one day, your passport go, goes from being your most prized possession to your biggest liability. Um, and uh, I think that when we're thinking about international recognition, we also have to think about 
what does that mean for individual Afghans and, and the, the living a, um, a dignified life, not in containment or isolation, but as part of an increasingly mobile global order. And I think we have a lot of discussions about globalization and people movement. And what's really interesting about the research that across national large and studies have shown um, that yes, mobility has increased um, over the, the past half a century, but in a very stratified way. And so for certain, um, for, for people from the global north, we've seen greater and greater visa-free access. And for people from the global south, especially um, South Asia and, and the Indian and the um, African continent, we've actually seen a decline in, in mobility. And, and, and by mobility, I think I'm thinking about what um, Amar said too, it's the, the privilege, it's, an, it's a form of capital, it's the privilege to not move. Um, uh, if, if you don't want to, um, but to be able to access, why, why does all this authorization and vetting matter? That's how you access uh, forms of transportation that are designed for humans. And without that kind of recognition, then we're forcing people into increasingly dangerous um, journeys. And so the, the, I, I think your question is really important because this question of, um, uh, it's not just a question of internal legitimacy, and sovereignty from that aspect, but external legitimacy, and whether um, other states are going to then trust that the Taliban is A, vetting who gets passports, and B, willing to provide a share intelligence about things like international um, intelligence sharing, Europol, Interpol, et cetera, um, about individuals. Um, and so th there's a whole vetting network here, and, and I think that that's, um, even looking at the fact that even prior to this, uh, uh, the Afghan passport could only unlock access to 26 countries. I think there's a real worry here that people are going to be contained. Thanks, Maura. Omar, can you comment on this dilemma of uh, the wish to not isolate, but also the challenges of engagement with the current regime? Um. To be very practical, the most important and pressing issue right now is the question of humanitarian assistance. Um, after the fall of Kabul, obviously, the economy is going down completely, not because just the international community starts funding us, but because the entire business community sort of collapsed. And actually, a few days ago, the Uzbekistan government um, wanted to sort of trade with the Taliban. And then their convoy of the Uzbek merchants came um, to Mazar Sharif in the north. But then they say that, oh, the Taliban, uh, they don't know how to do trade and they don't know how to use computer, they don't know how to do things. So they had to go back. So in a way, even in terms of technicalities, the trade is not happening. And at the same time, um, the Taliban using this idea of like humanitarian crisis as sort of like a Damocles sword. Now, people are hungry. People are, there's no jobs. I'm looking at my family. I'm looking at my friends back at home. Um, I mean, also my colleagues, all of us kind of lost our livelihoods and stuff. So um, what to do in that? And the Taliban just saying that you have to give us the money to run that. Now, to kind of approach that from a pure humanitarian level, a kind of perspective that makes a lot of sense of the world, or at least um, in terms of providing some aid, uh, kind of engage with Afghan song. But you cannot sustain a nation just by just keeping them hungry and giving them a little bit now and then, because we had the same experience in 2000, between, in the 90s. And it produced more problem at the end of the day than this. Yes, I mean, I, am, I myself lived in, um, on a ration of five bread, loaves of bread uh, per day, which was made of um, kind of, a, kind of a, a little bit of a doll, a little bit of like some other lentils mixed with, um, mixed with um, wheat flour. And it was hardly edible uh, in the 1990s. But at the same time, it actually even multiplied this. But, uh, but if you kind of put the one kind of thinking as international aid, as okay, confront with in terms of dealing with the Taliban. Now, the question is who is the Taliban? What are we going to deal with? We're not dealing with, um, when we think about Taliban government, Taliban state, and stuff, we're dealing literally with an ideological. Maybe some of them may act differently, but at the core of the Talibanism and as an ideology. And it's not about governing, it's about ruling. And for the regime, and it's kind of consolidating the regime. And so the more money comes to that, it's I 
based on the experience of the international engagement in 97, especially 98 to 2001. The most of this kind of the money that through UN came to Afghanistan to support in a way um, the incredible hunger that was in a way dominating the entire country in that time. The Taliban wanted that to be, you initially they allowed it to happen. And then once, and they said, you have to recognize this. And it will not happen, they just expelled everybody. But they've kept the money to consolidate themselves. And the same phenomena is happening today because as much as people say the Taliban are different. So we're dealing with an ideological group that's actually specifically about ruling rather than governing. And in this circumstances, the Afghans are hostages, the ordinary Afghans, including my family and everybody else around and my friends and every, are hostages. That may require, and I have to be very, in a way, very practical, that may require some more constructive engagement with the major, with the only power the Taliban are listening to is the Pakistani government to see how you have to channel in a way aid to somehow manage to get a little bit, but this to the people, but this is absolutely an unsustainable model. It may provide some relief in a short period of time, but it will not gonna solve it. We'll just simply in a way make the Afghans who actually learn to live a dignified life after a long time in the last 20 years, or at least part of the Afghans managed to live that, whether they were like in, in the North, South or East and West, is now make more dependent on it and actually will create further migration. Because one, one thing that we learned in the last 20 years, that we now, we used to a government that at least on a name and to a degree a little bit of a substance was responsible for service delivery. That's gone right now. So the government does not seem responsible. And if you look at the ideological narrative of Taliban about governance, it's about providing security. And that's it. Everything else is like, you're gonna do whatever you want to do. And now with the isolation, and everything, I believe maybe the Pakistanis, the Iranians, the Central Asians might get engaged with Taliban, but at the end of the day, it will be very politically motivated and will not benefit the Afghans. So if I say one thing, it, it might, we may require another consensus with international community, especially with the rich countries. We're actually thinking about that, not how to deal with Taliban, instead of like, the United States says something, Norway says something else, Germany says, says completely different things. And at the end of the day, the uncoordination, the sense of like this, this is the sense of like chaos that dominates Afghanistan, uh, especially between 2014 um, uh, afterwards and stuff, will create simply like consolidate the regime further and further at the cost of the population. So I think to engage with Afghanistan in terms of even humanitarian assistance, we need a consensus right now on the big level, how to channel money, how to engage. So there's that consensus, right, which is what is the international relations with the Taliban going to look like? And then there are a series of domestic conversations that are that are happening or more more pointedly that are not happening uh, among those countries that are responsible for having fought the war, but that are not taking responsibility then for opening their doors for those who've been displaced as a function of that war. And so I wanna pull in two questions from, from our audience on this point. One is about uh, the governments of, of Western governments and particularly the American government. I'm interested in what each of you can say to us about where you think policy sits at the moment in the United States on the question of of refugees in general and of Afghans in particular, and what you think a responsible policy looks like. Noura, you referred to the responsibility to protect as a norm, which we know um, gets deployed in a variety of ways that reflect the kind of hypocrisy of Western foreign policy, I think more than anything else. But that norm still exists. There are also notions of what what responsibility states had as a part of exiting and of ending a war? What does it, what could it have looked like to withdraw in a just fashion? And what implications are there for the responsibilities that you have to those who are displaced as a result? And then the other question is about institutions. Um, the, one of our audience members asked about institutions of higher education. 
what are their responsibilities and what are the opportunities that exist if if what Omar says is true, that migration can in and of itself be an act of, of political courage, of assertion of a kind of, of one's own ability to tell one's own narrative, what kind of space can institutions of higher education offer, our audience member asks, to give space for Afghans to tell their own stories, particularly regarding this transforming concept of citizenship. So we're, we have about 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna ask each of you to pull in whatever other closing comments you wanna make um, in this last round. So Asmat, let me come to you first. Sure, so I wanted to answer a, sort of a question that came in the chat about you know, whether or not I was documenting uh, civilian casualties caused by the Taliban. And, and yes, I've also tracked casualties caused by the Taliban in the particular place that I was sampling, a majority of the civilian deaths were the result of the scenario I described in which civilians were fleeing raids and were killed um, by, by airstrikes as they were fleeing. However, elsewhere I did uncover and document deaths at the hands of the Taliban. And what I found was happening the most, particularly in neighboring Helmand province, were these targeted assassinations of ordinary people they associated or accused of being a, a, you know, complicit with the government. Uh, so as an example of that, there was, uh, you know, a local imam of a mosque who washed bodies. Um, he was an ordinary civilian. Um, it's part of the duty. If you're at this mosque and you're running that mosque, you wash bodies after they're dead and prepare them for burial uh, in Islam. And some of the people who would come through this mosque, some of the bodies that would be taken there were those of Afghan soldiers. And for the role of having, you know, for example, uh, washed these bodies, he was executed. I've met people, who, you know, a woman I was spending time with recently, her husband was executed by the Taliban despite having, you know, their family having had ties to the Taliban. And that was something I saw that I just want to point out because it points to something we're seeing is distinctions between obviously what you're seeing is the central government and, you know, the Taliban that are really heading up what the federal government is. And then these local groups in different areas that may not necessarily follow the same chain of command. And so I was seeing executions and assassinations of people that it was really confusing to me would be targeted, um, many of them ordinary civilians. Um, and that's something that's, I think, extremely dangerous, right? Which is that it's not just, you know, on election day or in urban centers or, you know, unfortunately, you know, at, at gatherings at mosques, um, you know, it's also even people who, it shows you the people being targeted. It shows you the extent to which the reliability of us referring to the Taliban as a monolith is really dangerous, right? So even when we're talking about, um, you know, how does one negotiate with or engage with, you know, I'm not certain that those who are on the other ends of the negotiation, I'm not even just talking about Qatar, I'm talking about right now in Afghanistan, that, you know, you can ensure, I think half of the time that they're not conceding to things that you know might be in their best interest to concede to is because there are these groups they can't control on the ground and i know they don't want that getting out you know there are elements of the taliban that operate in different ways um, but i, I did want to mention that and, and really you know one quick thing that i wanted to do was also just show you i think some of the i think it's important to really give to, to show the I think the realities of what it's like for some of these people. And I just want to take a second to show you uh, just a few pictures of boys I met in the village that I was in, all of whose fathers were killed in this war. Um, you know, one of, one of the boys' father was a Taliban fighter. The rest of them were civilians. But I just want you to take a look because I think so often the fact that these people's deaths haven't been documented that so many of these areas, you know, if you haven't read the other Afghan women, a, a magazine piece that came out in the New Yorker in September, you know, I'd highly recommend it. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to give voice to these people whose uh, particular stories have never been really told. So these are just some of the boys who, uh, you know, I met whose fathers, you know, died and, you know, they're now growing up with extended family, but not necessarily getting the same resources or benefits or family structures that they could have. So I just want to take a second to look at some of these. 
Now his father was not killed, but he, and this is, you know, what I see a lot of that often doesn't get talked about. So often it's casualties whose uh, casualties, the result of a particular force that are tracked. And this is a guy who was playing with, he found a bullet was as a young boy, I think he was only six when this happened, was playing with a bullet and a rock didn't know and it exploded into his hand. His father was killed. These boys are brothers, their father died. And I'm just gonna stop there. Nora? Thank you for sharing those really um, powerful images. So I think that um, Polly, coming back to your question is, is sort of what can be done, um, what is being done, um, and, and you asked specifically about the US case. I think that we see that because the international human rights framework is, is so kind of constrained in many ways that we have a lot of different ad hoc and temporary statuses that emerge to provide protection that falls short of full asylum um, and, and access to citizenship rights, but still provides important protection. And so one of the things very easily could be done and should be done immediately is to add Afghanistan to the temporary protected status list, TPS. So just, just for the audience members who may not be familiar, um, when it comes to refugee status, you have one year after entering the US that you can apply for, for refugee status. If you miss that um, window, then you're no longer eligible. And more importantly, for a lot of people, if you cannot show that you've been individually persecuted, and your country is designated on the TPS list, then you have a much uh, greater likelihood of being able to stay in the country. So what is a TPS list? It's, it's a, um, a list of countries that the government deems as being unsafe enough to return to. And so if your country is on the TPS list, then you have a reprieve from deportation out of the US and you have work authorization. So um, for Syria, for example, is on the TPS list. El Salvador was on the TPS list for a long time, gets taken off and you become, you go from being legal to illegal. So there's problems with the TPS list, but it also, um, provides much more widespread um, protection for, for Afghans than what we see currently. So that's one concrete thing that can be done. We, we can cooperate. We're cooperating over um, migrant interdiction and, and, and border enforcement. We can also cooperate over safe passage under duress. Um, and that can include all of the actors that are currently involved in this cooperation globally, which includes non-state actors and private security um, uh, contractors and and you know when it comes to for example tracking terrorist suspects we spend a, we mobilize a lot of resources and yet somehow um, thousands um, of children unaccompanied minors just go missing right? um, and I think that you know um, what as much just showed us just reminds us that the human face behind these kinds of figures um, and so we, we have we have resources and we're making conscious decisions about where to mobilize security resources, who to track, and who to allow to just quote unquote disappear. Um, and finally, I think that, um, you know, bringing that expedited security vetting um, to, to, in the same way that private contractors do security vetting for um, the US government um, um, personnel, et cetera. We have capacity, um, again, and we can put money towards um, expedited security vetting in order to allow safe passage under duress. Um, and, you know, one, one of the questions that, that, that came up in the chat, and I think it's connected here, is this question of what other institutions can do, what other actors can do. And I think that when it comes to universities, um, I know Dapali has been working really hard on this um, with scholars at risk and other institutions that are really invested in trying to protect Afghan scholars and students right now. And I think that in the same way that TPS allows for blanket protection, universities and institutions can do more to um, use their roles as intermediary brokers, that is vouching for individuals on behalf of the state um, to, to um, attain something like an F-1 visa or a J-1 visa um, for scholars and to, to provide them a safe haven. And so I think that it is a, this obviously a very um, dystopic vision that we're seeing um, of the future, but it doesn't mean that nothing can be done. There are very concrete actions that we should be taking and can be taking right now.
Thank you so much, Nora. Omar? Well, on, on, I mean, I, I, I second uh, Dr. Laurie's everything she said and stuff, but at the same time, I have to confess, I don't know much about the legal technicalities of how this sort of things will work, but at least from an Afghan perspective um, uh, and kind of understanding what's happening to my generation right now. Um, um, it's after 40 years that, again, Afghanistan managed to create um, Kind of managed to sort of can produce a mass of the people who are capable of thinking, writing, and actually producing thoughts. The first generation was um, mostly massacred and were killed by when the communists took power in 1980. Some of those who went to kind of emigrated to Pakistan and stuff, they were mostly assassinated. A lot of them by between 1988, 87 to 89 of them. The third wave of it was between 2019 and 20, that in Kabul, we've seen a lot of target assassinations. And I went looking at the, my, my friends, my, um, my colleagues and others who are now scattered from the camps of Rwanda to Uganda, to Qatar, to Albania, um, some in India, very, very few though, some in Iran, and few in a few, very few in Pakistan, some God knows where else. And there is kind of this generation which, in which actually can, is capable of actually telling the, another, other, the other side of the story of what happened, because Afghanistan case was not just something for Afghanistan, what happened. It was perhaps the first time we see post-World War II, a massive international intervention in another country with economic, social, cultural, and political consequences and decisions and policies and everything. So Afghanistan can, is a case in which can, understanding Afghanistan case can provide in a way, really, really, I think good lessons for how the world can engage in this crisis again. And I think since World War II, I have to say this is, as I mentioned, this is the biggest. So somehow if these people find ways, I mean, if this, 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 this asset that's produced in the last 20 years with the work a lot of them, by the help of the international community, Afghanistan neighbors, Afghans themselves, and so somehow find way, means to write their stories, to produce their thoughts. And if this very complicated international system that Professor Laurie mentioned finds a way to accommodate them, I think that will be something that actually can be an asset for human heritage, for, and also the, perhaps a lesson for whatever intervention and in the future that may happen or may not happen. But at the end of the day for everyone, for scholars, for journalists, for, for human rights activists, for civil society movement, for women's movement, for everything. I think that can produce a lesson that I think will, be prof will have profound effects on the future of international intervention in any other place. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are coming to the end of our time and I just wanna say thank you so very much to our three really very thoughtful panelists who've shared such an important and diverse set of opinions and, and insights into the current moment. I also wanna just thank uh, Kian Tajbash for his leadership in this series and for when Afghanistan has sort of fallen out of the news cycle to, to do what's right, which is to put it back into the conversation as the beginning of a, of a year's worth of discussions around you know, what, is, what is and what will continue to be a defining challenge of international relations, which is the, the question of migration. And uh, I also wanna thank Columbia and South Juan Mastery for the leadership that this university is showing in responding um, to events in Afghanistan and to making room in, in the conversation for scholarship on and, and by Afghans. It's a very important um, contribution that Columbia continues to make. So with that, Kian, thank you again. I'll pass it right back to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have to say this was a, a from my point of view, a bittersweet type of experience. I mean, the paradox between such a wealth of scholarship, knowledge, understanding that we heard today from our panelists, all our panelists, but the paradox is we seem also helpless to be able to do things. Um, that really leaves us, I think, with a big challenge to continue on fo focusing on the question of Afghanistan, 
focusing on the question of multilateralism and how the world can engage. And we at the Committee on Forced Migration will continue focusing on Afghanistan, both from a scholarly point of view and through our practical efforts um, in Colombia's Afghanistan response. Again, I invite everyone in the audience, if they would like to know inform uh, more information about our Afghanistan response at Columbia, to go onto the website. And also, I invite you to um, uh, uh, remain in touch with us as we uh, develop our programming for the rest of the year. So with that, I'd like to thank very much uh, all our panelists, Asmat, Omar, and Noura, and of course, Dipali for putting together this, uh, uh, this panel. Um, and, uh, you know, we've gone from analytical to emotional. Those photographs, I think, uh, have, left, have left us with a, a, an urgency about continuing this, um, uh, you know, this focus on what to do uh, and to strengthen the multilateral, I think, efforts uh, around the question of Afghanistan. So I thank you all very much, and I look forward to remaining in touch. And best of luck with all your efforts. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all.